as you oh uh nice. Dr. Adid, I'm going to start off with a uh, stimulator trial setup, and then um, Pratik's going to come in and do more of the permanent um, installation process. And we've got Eric and Teresa from Boston Scientific and, and uh, Medtronic, respectively, with us. Um, so we wanted to start off by saying, first, before you're going to be doing this, generally what I do is thorough look at imaging. Uh, obviously, you've seen the patient physical examination, very important but looking at advanced spine imaging for access and appropriateness of the lead placement, not only at entry, but also up into the thoracic levels. Um, since we don't have the benefit of that, I took a little bit of liberty to go ahead and come in, sneak in a little bit early, uh, especially since um, our uh, patient specimen has already uh, failed multiple treatments, including <laughs> decompression and uh, spinous, interspinous fusion, as well as DRG. Uh, so I went ahead and placed uh, one lead in here, um, you'll see that it's at uh, the entry of T1112, which again, um, kind of in the setting of what's already been done here, thought that that was appropriate and it was a nice wide open interlaminar space. Um, and then we'll track the lead up here in a minute. But um, before we get started with placing a second lead, um, just wanted to highlight uh, there's different types of leads that you can use for trials and permanent placements today. We've got uh, Medtronic and Boston Scientific. Um, the Medtronic that's in there already uh, has a little bit of a curved tip stylet, placing it up there, uh, eight electrodes. And then Boston Scientific uh, with the Infineon, uh, 16 electrodes on there. And um, similarly, different types of needles. I generally use a uh, straight-tipped needle and there's also in a lot of the kits there's a curved tip and you also have the option of a coup de um, it's all personal preference really just after you do these what do you feel most comfortable with I generally use the straight tipped um, which is already placed in there and so I think we can go ahead and get started with placing the second lead and so we've got uh, an AP directly over with um, nice sharp uh, end plates right there at uh, T12, L1. Um, take a quick picture here. So there's another one, I'm just gonna move that up. You can see kind of right over the lower end of the uh, disc space, uh, top of the, the L1 vertebral body, kind of right over the uh, pedicle and the facet joint area and basically again, get a comfort level of what's gonna work best for you. Um, everybody's different. If you you know, see one of these, they might be down a little lower. Uh, same with uh, entry level, there's, you can, we went in T12 um, or T1112 here, but a lot of times people will prefer to go lower. Um, it all depends on you know, visualization, access. I tend to like to go around T12 L1 um, just because of access and a lot of times there may be surgical hardware inferiorly. Um, and the other thing, thinking back to physical examination is the, you know, how lordotic of, of a lumbar curve do they have, um, body habitus, that plays a big role in trajectory. Um, again, everybody's different. There's some kind of universal similarities where you'll hear most people, and it was already said today, of having a horizontal trajectory uh, from an inferior approach. Um, uh, roughly 30 degrees, again, depending on body habitus and uh, angle trajectory, um, that's gonna be more or less challenging. Um, but you wanna have as flat a view as you, uh, or a flat of plane as you can in order to avoid um, trauma into the, uh, into the dura, obviously. So I'm just gonna kind of initially place that a little bit and see how we're looking there. And like I said, this is a little bit so we're trying to get, even though we're coming in at an angle, we want to get as midline as we can. And as I'm coming down, I'm gonna be feeling for lamina. And it certainly uh, would be anesthetizing the area. Um, and patients generally under some sedation as well. So I'm just stepping off there. Uh, 
And then again, accessing, um, you can use a loss of resistance technique, a mechanical kind of loss technique. I'm gonna go ahead and just use a little bit of air, but the space has already been compromised. So I'll just kind of tactile feel as well as loss of resistance there. And just one more shot to see where we're at, kind of coming up midline, that post or the dorsal space. And so again, I have the lead and I like to just kind of come in with it, um, the curve pointing up so that I know that as it goes in, it's going to glide hopefully dorsal and not as much around to a lateral or medial sort of trajectory. And then Steve, do you mind um, bringing the view north? And then I'm gonna go live on Holst here. And so, and you might feel a little bit of resistance and sometimes patients have um, some discomfort. And so just be mindful of that, obviously, and going gently, but also um, trying to steer. And if you can see my right hand, I've got my hand on this, uh, what I call steering wheel, been informed the technical term is a steering hub by, by oh, steering cap, excuse me, um, by Teresa. And so what that's doing, and I'll just show you quickly on this other lead is as, as I'm turning the back, the tip, you know, I'll bring it down here. So as I'm turning the back, this is gonna turn the angle of the tip of the lead, right? So we're doing that. And so one thing to look out for is if you already have a lead in there, which we have the benefit of, is to see if we can see any movement from that lead that lets us kind of confirm, maybe not confirm, but suggest that we're in the right space um, in the dorsal column. So just want to go ahead and back up a little bit here. You can see how I've kind of moved it a little bit there. And then again... Kind of come up. And if you notice that the lead that I did put in before the demonstration is midline and actually to the left, um, and that's just you know, what you'll find in practice is even as much as you can try to turn these and redirect them, they do just kind of go the path of the dorsal space, which uh, oftentimes is a pyramidal shape and, and fairly midline. But you know what? I'm just going to double check. I. One thing, you can do a contralateral oblique. I've, I've just do a quick lateral, and that's just something that's been helpful for me, just to, doesn't take that much more time for me. And uh, especially coming out of training and everything, if you have a hard time uh, appreciating a, con uh, a contralateral view, this is just a good, clear way. So you can see we're uh, pretty much back there. I think that we're just kind of losing some of the um, fullness of the, oh, let's go ahead and go over top. As you could appreciate that we're still midline there and still in the dorsal space. So then what we're going to do is go ahead and um, keep advancing here. All the while trying to get these. We, we don't want them lined up over on top of each other. It's best if they're side by side. Uh, I don't know that and we, it's okay if they're crossing over a little bit, but not where the terminals are. And so you can see how those just kind of rested there. And so we've got 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. So we're kind of top of 8 there. Maybe get that one up a little bit. And then you can maybe stagger them a little bit. Can even bring them down to get um, coverage optimally, kind of, you know, T, T8 down to, to t bottom of T10. And then at this point, um, we can confirm a lateral again. I feel pretty confident that we're there. And so we would just um, confirm that. And then we will have a, a short trial of the, you can see we're, 
posterior there. And come back over top, Steve. And then at that point, we will, I'm not sure if the, yeah, we've got camera on this. We'll go ahead and set up some stimulation trial with the patient right here on the table under sedation, but hopefully still alert and able to respond to um, our questions. And so for Medtronic, uh, we've got kind of the temporary uh, external battery pack pulse generator, and then this is their um, permanent implantable pulse generator, which we'll discuss in just a little bit here. And so you go ahead and just kind of cook, hook these up in the receptacles, and then um, assistant or representative will go ahead and um, stimulate different levels, left, right, and ideally just looking to um, optimize the coverage of where this patient's pain, back, left leg, right leg, what have you. Um, and you'd be surprised that even if it doesn't look like it's exactly right, I'd still, um, usually if, if it's in a relatively appropriate, acceptable position, you'd be surprised just throwing it on and stimulating and you'd see, you might be surprised that you're covering everything and that's great, um, or needing to make some readjustments, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, once the stimulation is good, then you can go ahead and uh, remove the stylets and confirm the uh, placement again hasn't moved too much because um, the stylet again is rigid and has that curvature at the end and then go ahead and remove the needle all the while making sure you're not disturbing. And then there's different uh, ways to secure the leads. Um, you know, more traditional is just kind of using a little anchor device with uh, some sutures and then there's some other ways and then go ahead and uh, re-hook up the, the stimulator, package everything up and then you're initiating your trial. So I think that's kind of the quick and dirty of it. Um, I don't know if we want to do questions on the trial or go ahead and transition to more of the permanent placement process. Chris, great job. Um, I was just a couple comments on that. You use a loss of resistance technique or care, which is an excellent one. I'm sorry, we're not, I don't know if anybody's saying anything, we're not able to hear anything in the room here. Chris, can you hear me? No. There we go. Chris, can you hear yep. me? can. Nice job. Uh, just noticed a couple things. You use loss of resistance to uh, air, which I think is fine, and probably most people do. I've found that uh, once getting in there, I'll usually put about five or seven cc's of saline sometimes because that helps to kind of depress uh, or lower the, the um, you know, the dura a little bit and helps to advance the needle sometimes just to get it going initially. Um, also, I can't emphasize enough, just like you did, minimum of 30% angle, uh, your angle of attack, so to speak. The more the acute, the better. And I usually use a six inch needle and just try to slide it off the inferior lamina and then just slide it underneath the superior lamina. And you often don't even don't need a loss resistance because you're gonna be in the epidural space. If you just, I put a slight bend in the needle off the inferior lamina, turn it up this way, slide under the superior lamina, and you're going to be there 90% of the time. Um, so that works out well. But well done. Any any questions on that? Great job. Okay. Good job, Chris. All right. <clears throat> so now, you know, we have the trial. Um, you've documented 80%, 80% relief in both pain and function. Um, you know, now kind of decision comes with the patient. You know, if the patient is a older, per, older female or male and they don't feel the capacity or need to charge um, the battery or ability to charge, you may go with a non-rechargeable battery. Um, or you go with the rechargeable one, you may take things into consideration such as rotator cuff issues, shoulder arthritis, um, if you're implanting sort of in the posterior aspect. Um, and the other part of this is figuring out what side, you know, you act, the patient wants it. If they're right-handed, you'll typically implant the battery on the right side. Um, if they're left-handed, you'll try to implant it on the left side. Um, so you can see the size variation in the batteries here too. This is a non-rechargeable um, that usually lasts two to three years. Um, sometimes a little bit longer. And then this is the rechargeable, the most common one. We, we say, we, when we tell the patient what kind of battery it is or show them, say it's the size of an Oreo cookie, come through. roughly. Thanks. Um, 
and this is the one that lasts a little bit longer, um, but they do have to charge the battery. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of get started. There's already a midline incision here. Um, so typically what we'll do is, let me get a floor over here. So I'm just gonna take one of Chris's leads out here. And what I'll do is I'll actually make an incision about a level or the spinous process. I'll mark usually about, if I'm entering at 11, 12, I'll make an incision starting at the inferior border of T12 down to about the tip of the top of the border of L1. So it's about a, a one inch incision here. So you can see my, let me see here. Down here. Let's get the nail tip there. Start. So I'm just gonna kind of mark out the spot here. All right, so if our entry point is where, you know, Chris had it at 11, 12, I will typically mark a spot sort of on this spinous process here, which is already open um, on this uh, cadaver. And I typically go down to about here. You wanna create enough space for you, for you to have working room, but you also wanna have um, enough space to anchor the leads in as well. So you wanna keep a small incision, but if you need a little bit larger, you know, that's the reason why. So with this open here, I'll take kind of the same approach um, that Chris did off to the side, just paramedian. And same, same degree, 30 degrees or less. The flatter the needle, the better. Um, and we'll kind of just advance this in here following the interlaminar space. And like I said, the, the, there's been a lot of cut down here. Patients failed a lot of therapies. So, um, so we'll go in here kind of enter the space. And we'll put the leads in, just kind of how we had it. It came with blood, so. First thing for everything. Same thing, you know, we would lose, uh, use last block, uh, loss of resistance with saline. Feel it. So if we can get the news to. This is kind of going in there. You know, we'll we'll steer this thing up. I know it's not an ideal. Just kind of showing. You can go north. Oh my god! Thank you. Uh, so this is just kind of just kind of demonstrating. It's most likely anterior. It's not posterior placement. But once you have the leads in place and you've sort of removed the stylets here, which is what I just did. And then you're also removing the needle, making sure you're feeding the, uh, the SES uh, lead to make sure it stays in the right spot. Now you have your wire kind of just there in the space you need. So what you'll do is you'll actually take an anchor. Yeah, so these are some click anchors that you can see here. So they have these two little holes if you want to call it, and they have a little screw on top. So you kind of slide this anchor onto the lead, and you bring it down. You can use a debakey, um, so try not to damage the lead. Oh, this one's still off. Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you'll bring this uh, anchor in. Let's take any here. That's okay. Use this one. Again, pulling the stylet out. So we'll pop this anchor here. So this anchor kind of goes right on. It slides all the way down into the sub queue. Yeah, take the needle though. So we'll throw this anchor, it goes all the way down. And what it does is it gives you an area to 
anchor the lead into, onto the subcutaneous tissue. So it kind of goes in here. I haven't cut down this way here, but you can essentially cut down and then anchor using, they have actually a device, we don't have it with us. Oh, okay. Um, where you, you have these now holes here, right? So what we try to do is we anchor this to the sub-Q using these holes um, with a device that kind of helps. I'll just cut down here. Just cutting down. So you have a couple different ways that you could do this. You could do this using the trial approach that Chris did and then sort of cut down to the area that you need. Kind of like this. And then you can do it or you can make a midline incision kind of like how I showed you. So this will go all the way down. And then what you do is you end up locking and clicking it in with the, the mini wrench that we have here. So this thing goes specifically with it here. So you can see it. And so we click this back in. And you, you'll hear a couple clicks. And so that. And you hear those clicks. That means that the, the lead is actually, you know, the anchor is actually right on the lead. And then what we'll end up doing is you could either use the fixate device or you can also suture using 2O silk where you can kind of go in, come back out, and then kind of suture the lead onto the subcutaneous tissue so that it doesn't move. So you can do that and then cut move scissors. Yeah. Let's cut it with this. All right. And then you can kind of chest tube tie or you know suture the lead on one side. And then you do the same thing on the second hole of that anchor just to keep it tight. So once you've anchored the I kind of just did it, you know, halfway there. But once you've anchored the lead into both the leads, um, I'm just showing one here. But once you've anchored the lead sort of into the skin and you've decided you know, that the patient wants the battery on the right or the left, what you'll do is you'll actually measure out and map where the battery would go. So you take the template here, this is right here, and you kind of put it either here, some people will prefer it in the front, um, I usually put it right, right next to where the incision is. We'll mark it, we'll anesthetize that area. So it gives us a little bit of idea of what the width is. We'll go ahead and anesthetize this. And then what we end up doing is opening this up here. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll cut down, use Bovi to make sure there's no bleeding, and I'll actually test to see if the, the template fits in there. And as you can see, it's sitting pretty nice. And this, this implant can't be more than one centimeter deep, otherwise they won't be able to charge it. If it's a non-rechargeable, um, it can be as deep as you want. So you can also test the actual battery in here, and you can see that it's sitting pretty nice. So what I'll do now is you have to create a conduit from the lead over to the battery. So where this lead is there, you'll tunnel. I put a little curve in it just to make sure we stay superior. We don't want this tunneler to dive. So we'll kind of go in here, and then you could see it kind of come out from the other side. And then we'll unscrew this. It, cre it leaves a little straw in place. And then what we end up doing with the straw is bringing it and putting the lead through the straw just so that it can come out the other side here. And like I said, the, the, the leads aren't anchored too well because of how the incision is there. And then what this ends up doing is we pull off the notches from the battery and plug this guy in here. So you can see it here. This one's a four port battery, so four leads could go in here. And what we end up doing is kind of popping this in this way. All right, and these are trial leads. So the actual implant leads will be eight contacts. The trial leads have 16 on the Boston Scientific one. So you can see why there's still some left over on the side here. But essentially, once the lead is in, we will screw this 
the nut back into and get the clicking sound here to make sure it's secure. Can you hear that? And then what we end up doing, this option is up to you. Some people will suture the lead behind it. Um, I just kind of tuck it under, make a couple of uh, wraps around it, loops in the back. And then I will just kind of insert it right into that battery pack there. And then it kind of sits here. You'll close the lateral incision up. You'll close the midline incision up. Um, and then likelihood is that you'll have your rep or you know your CS basically say, it's all green, it's all red, there's some impedances, um, and that's how we do it. Hmm. So this was the fixate device that we we're mentioning. So what it is is essentially an easier way to anchor this device down without having to suture. So those little two holes that I had kind of shown you, they're right in there. You could see them here. So this device will actually go in here and then come around this way. So how we do this one, this anchor is a little broken, but. Essentially, you go into the, to the hole, you press this one here, press down, come back up, you turn it, and then you press going back into the second hole now, you can see it here, and you push down again, and you release. And that essentially sutures down. You use the, the notch here to get the wire and bring the loop all the way down, just like that. So you can see it there. Now it's kind of situated. I know one of the uh, loops is broken. And then you use the other end of it is the cutter, and you cut the wire. And then you can continue with the process there. And that's the basis of an implant. Like I said, the incision here is a lot bigger. Your incision would be about this big, from one spinous process to the inferior, process, inferior portion of the one spinous process to the superior portion of the next one. Just enough space for the anchors to sit. All right, Pratik, great job. Hey, uh, any questions from the audience, the fellows on, on that right there? Uh, well done. Nice, nice demonstration, Pratik. I will just add a couple uh, items. Uh, you know, I think I implanted my first stem back in 1992 or thereabouts. Um, so a couple things. Uh, the programming is so much better now. I mean, it's compared to, say, five, ten years ago. I mean, we used to explant half of these things after three years. And now with the advanced programming, uh, it's just night and day difference. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm a big fan of the Fixate device, just a big time saver. The other thing I'll say is <clears throat> be meticulous with your subcutaneous pockets with hemostasis. Otherwise, you'll end up getting a few uh, uh, seromas, which are not a disaster, but it's uncomfortable for the, for the patient. So just all my pockets, I'm very meticulous with uh, electrocautery, but also using Surgicel and, or uh, gel foam with thrombin just to get that pocket as dry as possible to avoid a, a pocket seroma. Um, but great job. No other questions. Are there? Last call? Okay, good job.